Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is tit for tat. Last time, we talked about the grim trigger strategy in an infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma. But there might be something that's concerning about a grim trigger strategy. It is extremely harsh. Think about this. A single misstep from the opponent will end cooperation forever. If you defect just a single time over the course of a game, then from that period forward, I will never cooperate with you again. And if you're concerned that Grim Trigger is overly harsh in that regard, you might then wonder whether nicer strategies, strategies that do not terminate cooperation forever at a single misstep, whether those types of strategies can still yield efficient outcomes. In other words, can I develop a nicer strategy, a punishment strategy that isn't so extreme, not as extreme as Grim Trigger, that would still convince the other side to cooperate with me by threat of this punishment, even though it's not as harsh as Grim Trigger. And that's what Tit for Tat is going to do. So remember that we're still looking at this prisoner's dilemma with the stage game right there. We infinitely repeat this game with all previous moves revealed and discounting throughout time. Tit for Tat says the following. You begin the game by cooperating. Then, in all future periods, you duplicate your opponent's strategy from the previous period. So if your opponent cooperated in the previous period, you cooperate in this period. And likewise, if your opponent defected in the previous period, you defect in this period. It's that simple. There's nothing else to it. You don't worry about what they did in any previous period other than just the period before this one. So now that we know what a tit-for-tat strategy looks like, the question then becomes whether it is an equilibrium for two players to play tit-for-tat in this infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma. Well, if we have two players playing tit-for-tat against each other, think about what happens. On the equilibrium path of play, everyone will cooperate forever. That's because you start out by cooperating, I start out by cooperating, and then in the second period we duplicate what the other person did previously, which was to cooperate, so we cooperate in the second period, and so forth. So if we were to play tit-for-tat, then on the equilibrium path of play, supposing that it is an equilibrium, everyone would cooperate forever. Off the equilibrium path of play, again assuming that this is an equilibrium, something pretty weird happens. And I have diagrammed that below. In the first period, if I were to deviate from the strategy, the tit-for-tat strategy, which says that I should be cooperating in this first period, if I deviate to defecting, then in the second stage, you do what I did previously, and I did what you did previously. So I will be cooperating in the second stage, and you will be defecting. And then in the third period, we flip that, where now I am going to defect, and you're going to cooperate, and so forth. And that goes on forever. So if someone were to deviate in a single period from the tit-for-tat strategy then you alternate between outcomes where I cooperate and you defect, and you defect and I cooperate. That's a little bit weird, and we're going to talk about that more later on, but not right now. If we are curious about whether this is an equilibrium, we have to answer a couple of different questions. We have to look at both on the path of play and off the path of play to see if there are any profitable deviations. We're only going to be looking at on the path of play right now. We're not going to be looking at off the path of play. And I'll talk about why that's the case in the moment. So let's first figure out whether on the path of play, anyone would want to deviate from this. All right, well, on the path, what do we do? If I'm not deviating my payoff for cooperating forever, we know what that is. So in this hypothetical equilibrium payoff, I will receive a payoff of 3 in the first period, 3 in the next period, 3 in the period after that, and so forth. And if you discount appropriately, you get the payoff on your screen right there. That's because, again, if we're cooperating forever, which is what would happen if neither one of us were to deviate from the tit-for-tat strategy, I get this cooperate-cooperate outcome in every period, which awards me a payoff of 3. Now we need to think about what my payoff would be if I were to deviate from this in the first period. So instead of receiving this payoff of 3 for the first period, as well as a payoff of 3 forever, if I were to deviate to defecting while you're supposed to cooperate, I would get a payoff of 4 for that period. And then in the next period, we would flip-flop strategies where I would cooperate and you would defect, and I would get a payoff of 1 in that period. Then we would flip-flop again and again and again and again. 
which means my payoff for defecting in the first period would be to receive a payoff of four in that first period, and then a payoff of one in the second period, a payoff of four in the third period, a payoff of one in the fourth period, and so forth. And the way you defect is, or rather the way you discount those values, is how you see on your screen right now. So if we want to answer whether I could profitably deviate from cooperating in this first period, then what we need to be comparing is this. If this inequality holds, then I would not want to deviate. This is because my payoff for maintaining cooperation here would be greater than my payoff for deviating. So we could expect cooperation to be optimal and rational for these tit-for-tat players if this inequality holds. Well, like what we uncovered in the Grim Trigger lecture, we can't easily solve this sort of inequality because we have an infinite stream of payoffs. But we also know from the lecture on geometric series that there are different ways to rewrite these payoffs into fixed amounts that do not trail on forever. And I gave you a few formulas back then, I'm now going to be applying them now so that the three payoff that continues on forever, you might remember this one from before, that's just three over one minus delta. We actually saw that in the Grim, Tr uh, Grim Trigger lecture, I should say, previously. What we see on the right is a little bit more complicated, and if you're confused about how we arrived at that, this is one of those formulas, or actually both of these are formulas that I gave you in the geometric series lecture, where 4 over 1 minus delta squared is your payoff for every odd period. If you receive a payoff of 4 in every odd period, then you get, in just those odd periods, 4 divided by 1 minus the discount factor squared. And the second value on the right-hand side of the inequality is delta over 1 minus delta squared, which is your payoff for receiving a value of 1 in every even period. So there's this implicit 1 times delta there to reflect the fact that you're receiving a payoff of 1 in each of those periods. So if this inequality holds, then we can expect cooperation to occur. We've shown that cooperation can occur and not have a situation where we would have one of those players want to deviate to defecting. So you can solve this with some algebra, which I have quickly gone through right there, and what we eventually get is delta is greater than or equal to one half. So if delta is greater than or equal to one half, a player is perfectly happy to continue cooperating and not want to deviate to a defection strategy in the first period. Okay, so now we can get some comments on what's going on here with tit for tat. First is that the same process that we went through here to show that there was no valuable or no profitable deviation in the first period is the same process that we can show for any generic period that a player would not want to deviate. This is just like what we did in the Grim Trigger strategy lecture, where we showed that the same logic behind why a player wouldn't want to deviate in one period holds to every other period, and so we can thereby conclude that in no period on the path of play would either player want to deviate from these tit-for-tat strategies. So that's a good thing. That's cool. Another thing to note here is that the cut point that we eventually received in this previous slide, remember this, delta greater than or equal to one half, this cut point for the tit for tat lecture here actually matched the cut point for the grim trigger lecture. That's actually a coincidence. It's not always true that grim trigger and tit for tat are going to produce the same cut point on the discount parameter. So here and in the previous one on grim trigger, if the players were sufficiently patient, in particular if delta were greater than or equal to one half, we would have both players willing to play those punishment strategies, whether it was grim trigger or tit for tat. It can be different, again, depending on the exact payoffs that you see in your two by two game, in your stage game prisoner's dilemma. If you change those payoffs a little bit, then you would not have these same one half cut points for both Grim Trigger and Tit for Tat. So don't think that this is a general rule that they're always supposed to be equal. They're not. It's just a random coincidence based on the payoffs that I chose. The last thing to note is that Tit for Tat strategies do extremely well in tournaments that game theorists have created to analyze the infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma. This is actually something really cool. 
There is this book called The Evolution of Cooperation, and I'll link to it in the comments section or the, the video description down below. This Evolution of Cooperation book was one of the two works that really got me interested in this sort of discipline and is part of the reason why I'm now doing this for a living. This book took a look at what happens if you ask a bunch of really smart people to create strategies for an infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma and then have them play against each other. So you can cooperate, you can defect, you can do whatever you want in any one of these periods. All you need to do is write a computer code that describes what your strategy is. And then what the author of this book, Robert Axelrod, did is put them all together had them play randomly against each other, play this infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma, and accrue payoffs. And what what Robert Axelrod found was that these tit-for-tat strategies actually do exceedingly well in these sorts of tournaments. So in that regard, these tit-for-tat strategies are, are somewhat attractive. And this book received tons and tons of citations. Robert Axelrod ended up receiving a National Medal of Science largely for what he wrote about in this book, The Evolution of Cooperation. So if you're looking for something to read, go ahead and check the video description below. It's a great read. I definitely recommend it. Now, that being said, while I just praised Tit for Tat greatly, there's one slight issue that we haven't covered in this lecture, and that is that we haven't looked at what happens off the path of play. We stated and we've shown that conditional on players following what would happen off the path of play, in other words, this flip-flopping between cooperating and defecting in all future periods, if players were to actually do that, then no one would want to deviate in any period on the path of play. No one would want to deviate from cooperating to defecting. But we haven't shown that players would actually want to follow through on that threat. And this gets back to our discussion many, many lectures ago on the difference between Nash equilibria and subgame perfect equilibria. In Nash equilibria, we don't need to worry about whether threats are credible or not. And in contrast, that's exactly what subgame perfect equilibrium studies. Subgame perfect equilibrium studies whether the threats and promises a player make are credible over time. And what we're going to be seeing in the next lecture is that this threat to vacillate back and forth between cooperating and defecting is not actually credible. So what that means is that while this tit-for-tat strategy can form a Nash equilibrium, it cannot form a subgame perfect equilibrium, at least not under reasonable conditions. And so for that reason, subgame perfect equilibrium is a little bit overrated. And we'll see exactly why this subgame perfect equilibrium doesn't form with tit for tat in the next lecture. So I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.